from the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise, with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalm for meditation is Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people. Give deliverance to the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. May they fear you while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass like showers that water the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and peace abound, till the moon be no more. May he have dominion from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him, and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him, all nations serve him. For he delivers the needy when he calls, the poor and him who has no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy, and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence he redeems their life, and precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live, may gold of Sheba be given to him, may prayer be made for him continually, and blessings invoked for him all the day. May there be abundance of grain in the land, on the tops of the mountains may it wave, may its fruit be like Lebanon, and may people blossom in the cities like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever, his fame continue as long as the sun. May people be blessed in him, all nations call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. That psalm is used for Epiphany, and that psalm is Psalm 72. It's used for Epiphany, recognizing the coming of the kings to recognize Jesus Christ as Lord even at his birth. Um, Specifically, the Magi representing the nations of the earth, those foreign to Israel coming and looking to him. Now, being mindful of that, let's turn to Exodus chapter 10, our text for meditation in today, verses 1 to 20, and see how uh, Pharaoh, as one of those Gentile nations, or a representative of one of the Gentile nations, acts in respect to the Lord Almighty. <clears throat> So Exodus chapter 10, beginning at the first verse. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials, so that I may perform these miracles, miraculous signs of mine among them, that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, and that you may know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country below tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left under, after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. They will fill your houses and those of all your officials and all the Egyptians something something neither your fathers nor your forefathers have ever seen from the day they settled in this land till now. Then Moses turned and left Pharaoh. Pharaoh's officials said to him, How long will this man be a snare to us? Let the people go so that they may worship the Lord their God. Do you not yet realize that Egypt is ruined? Then Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. Go worship the Lord your God, he said, but just, you, but just who will be going? 
Moses answered, We will go with our young and old, with our sons and daughters, and with our flocks and herds, because we are to celebrate a festival to the Lord. Pharaoh said, The Lord be with you if I let you go along with your women and children. Clearly you are bent on evil. No, have only the men go and worship the Lord, since that's what you have been asking for. Then Moses and Aaron were driven out of Pharaoh's presence. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over Egypt, so that locusts will swarm over the land and devour everything growing in the fields, everything left by the hail. So Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt, and the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all that day and all that night. By morning the wind had brought the locusts. They invaded all Egypt and settled down in every area of the country in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts, nor will there ever be again. They covered all the ground until it was black. They devoured all that was left after the hail, everything growing in the fields and the fruit of the trees. Nothing green remained on tree or plant in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now forgive my sin once more and pray to the Lord your God to take this deadly plague away from me. Moses then left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord changed the wind to a very strong west wind, which caught up the locusts and carried them into the Red Sea. Not a locust was left anywhere in Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So... <clears throat> I'll give, I'll give a brief address to the locusts and what, the, what this is uh, before I get into some of the more spiritual matters, especially Pharaoh representing the Gentile, his Gentile nation and what his disposition is towards the Lord. So locusts are insects that just basically consume, 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 and they are also in massive groups. Typically they travel in massive groups and because they just consume, 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 they leave nothing left in the land that they came from, so this is why they're traveling in large groups, because nothing is left on there for, the, for their population to feed on, so they have to keep traveling to new areas. So this is very much a plague, and it is something that still kind of re, re, returns every once in a while in Egypt, oh, sorry, in, in Africa, where you have this plague of bugs going around, consuming all these things, and you have to try and uh, basically save your crops. However, with these things, how can you try and stop a whole, <laughs> a whole swarm of insects? That's nearly impossible. Well, you can try and destroy some of them, but they'll always remain part of the population. Uh, not that this really matters with, in regards to this particular plague, because they were so numerous to begin with that there is no hope of ever actually trying to stave them off in any sort of way, even if you start going out and attacking these things. Um, I'm sure on the internet you can also find videos of certain insects that just swarm in massive numbers. And that would be somewhat representative of this plague, although this plague would be over the entire land of Egypt, so kind of giving you an idea of, of not just a localized area as in some of the videos in, online, but everywhere. But uh, some of these videos online uh, with swarms of various insects, you can see that they are like, they're swarming on top of the ground and they are like a foot thick, a foot thick of insects in this area. And while that has a definite creep factor and you might want to just shiver at the thought, uh, you can also expand that to the entire land of Egypt and see just how big of a problem this was. So basically, God was going to remove whatever was left after the plague of hail uh, because if the people had thought, oh, well, the Lord did not destroy quite everything with the hail because we still had a few plants left. We still had fruits on some trees. It was only some of the crops, a fair bit of our crops in the field, so we only have to ration our food for a few months. Well, then the Lord goes, nope, and he sends the, the locusts in upon the land so that they consume everything else. So God is still uh, showing his power over uh, not only agriculture but over insects, uh, basically taking away everything from the Egyptians so that they must let the people go, uh, the Hebrew people go. 
Now this was basically the message that Moses and Aaron conveyed from, from the Lord to, Mo, to Pharaoh. Uh, the Lord said, go to Pharaoh for I have hardened his heart. And that is an interesting phrase. So he, the Lord might actually be referring to a couple plagues before. Because in the plague of hail, at the end of that, so this is chapter 9, verse 34, uh, it says, When Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts. So <clears throat> it might be a, a uh, cooperative action that Pharaoh and the Lord are hardening in Pharaoh's heart at this point in time. Or, or the Lord might be referencing one of the prior, one of the prior uh, plagues. Where he, where it says, uh, the Lord hardened his heart. So this was uh, two plagues ago, the plague of boils among animal, uh, among humans and livestock. So chapter nine, verse twelve. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron. Uh, so we don't exactly know how how Pharaoh is is doing this, but uh, he's probably hardening his own heart in addition to the Lord hardening his uh, hardening the heart of Pharaoh. In either case. Pharaoh is just being given over to the, to the desires of his heart, and we can see this quite clearly as he's trying to negotiate with God. So the Lord says that, uh, I'm going to send more miraculous signs, so referring to locusts, and then uh, he's also foreshadowing uh, the plague of darkness and the plague of the, the death of the firstborn, which are the remaining plagues. He tells Moses and Aaron to go, er, Moses and Aaron go to, to uh, Pharaoh, Tell Pharaoh that there's going to be a plague of locusts, that they're going to consume everything. And Pharaoh just kind of just lets them go off. He doesn't really... He's gone through this routine seven times... Sorry, six times before this. Maybe I've lost count. <laughs> I've lost count. Uh, no, no, yeah, six times before this. So what's, a, what's one more plague to him? But uh, Pharaoh's officials, they kind of go, like, what on earth are you doing? We're going to be, we're, Egypt is already going to die off because we don't have enough food to, to sustain the population. So why are you trying to make things even worse for us? Go, go and get them back. And uh, Well, they haven't, they didn't say go and get them back. But they're saying, what are you doing? Uh, Egypt is already ruined. <laughs> what, make good decisions now. So uh, Pharaoh sends for Moses and Aaron, and Pharaoh brings them back into his presence, and he's trying to enter into negotiations with them. So uh, Moses and Aaron representing God, Pharaoh representing an unbelieving nation, and Pharaoh is trying to enter into negotiations with God, basically, in order to try and save his people. Well, save his people, save himself. Don't quite know his exact motivations, but... Uh, Pharaoh's basically just trying to enter into negotiations with God. So he asks, well, basically, what, is, what are the Lord's demands? Because um, he says, well, go worship the Lord. He knows that, that part. But, he's, but then he's asking just who will be going. So he's kind of asking, what are, what are your demands uh, for trying and, and enact this, this worship of the Lord? So Moses tells him, basically, everybody, all of us, all the nation of Israel will go out into the desert to whom sacrifice to our Lord, bringing all our flocks with us, for this will be a festival. Uh, they need to have many, many animals there, not only for sacrifices, but also for their own sustenance, because if they're there for days, they're going to need to, uh, to cook their own food and make sure that they don't die off in the desert. So Moses says, everybody has to go. That is, that are, those are the terms of the Lord. All the nation of Israel has to go out in the desert and sacrifice to the Lord. So Pharaoh said, <clears throat> says, uh, The Lord be with you if I let you go along with, with your women and children. Clearly you are bent on evil. So he says, Oh yeah, I could let all of you go, but you're going to do something stupid or evil to me. So he's uh, basically assuming that uh, uh, he'll be he'll be far worse off if the entire nation of, of Israel goes to worship the Lord. So he says, no, if you're doing this, I'm going to suffer. Therefore, not, not the entire nation. And he says, have only the men go worship the Lord. 
since that's what you have been asking for. So he's willing to let the men go, but he's going to have the women and the children and the flocks and the herds uh, stay in Egypt. Now, if you only let the male population go, and you decide suddenly, as Pharaoh might want to do, and as he does a little bit later in the book when he tries to pursue the nation of Israel and he finally does let them go, if Pharaoh decides to put himself in between the entire male population of the Hebrew people and the women and children, then Pharaoh can basically cause the Hebrew people to become extinct. So he can separate the men from the women. Uh, the men will eventually die off, whether through war or through old age. And then Pharaoh can just swoop in, take all the women for his own people, uh, possibly kill or raise the children, we don't know. And then the Hebrew people will be completely wiped out because as they have uh, no heads of household left to continue all the traditions, continue all the, uh, uh, all the promises of the Lord basically coming through the male line. So that might be what Pharaoh would possibly want to do. We don't quite know this, but that is the way that it would happen. But, uh, uh, but just giving the sheer, sheer suggestion that only the men go and keep the rest of the nation here in Egypt as hostage, Pharaoh is trying to, again, negotiate with God and try to make sure that he's coming out on top keeping hostages so that the Lord still must be subject to him. So Pharaoh wants God Almighty to compromise on his promises. Uh, some of this is uh, Lord is trying. Sorry, the Pharaoh is trying to cause God to compromise on His law, not not doing as He says, or, or, or uh, allowing certain exceptions to the divine commands. But really, at the heart of it, Pharaoh is really trying to get God to compromise on His promises. So Pharaoh wants God subservient to the world, uh, subservient to God's own, wants God subservient to his own creation rather than God being God and having authority over all things, being the creator over the creation. This does not happen. God won't allow this. So God says, calls to Moses, says, stretch out your, your hands over Egypt and bring the locusts. So God does not compromise on these things, nor would we actually want him to. If God allowed his law to be compromised, then we would be living in a world of lawlessness where everything would go unpunished. One of the worst examples I can think of, of kind of how the world fails in its justice, uh, is with uh, the dictator Pol Pot. Uh, he was dictator of Cambodia for quite a, well, he had full executive power for only a few years, but he exercised control in the government for a couple decades after that. So Pol Pot uh, organized, or at least directed, the Cambodian genocide. So Pol Pot is responsible for the deaths of millions upon millions of people. Millions upon millions of people who had committed no crime whatsoever, and he slaughtered all these innocent people. Not just the adults, but also the babies as well. Putt-Putt was evil. He did many, many evil things. And I do hope that he, he realized his evil before he perished, but in all likelihood that did not happen. For what Paul Putt did was, he realized that he was probably going to be persecuted, so he uh, moved kind of hid himself away, and died in peace. When you hear that, this person who's responsible for the death of, of millions of people got away without being punished whatsoever in this world, then we would say that justice has been compromised. We do not want that to happen. We do not want God to make exceptions to his commands, because if he does, then the world can get away with murder much like Pulpit did. And that's just not right. So if God compromises on his law, then nothing is forbidden to us and we can do anything we want without consequence. 
But if God is a God of justice and he does not compromise on his law, then people will pay for their sins and will be called to account. So pulpit, even though he uh, died peacefully in this world, in the next, as we enter into the last day and final judgment, he will not escape. The Lord will call him to account and will punish him in accordance with his sins. Now, Pharaoh also asks God to compromise on his promises. Not just the law, but the promises. Because the Lord, the God of Israel, promised to the nation of Israel that he would deliver them from slavery and bring them into the promised land. God cannot compromise on this, or otherwise the people will be lost. And this isn't just because, it's, oh, that he needs to uphold his word to, remain, to restore his own honor. That is certainly a part of it, and God does mention this a few times throughout Scripture. I remember once in particular to Ezekiel. But what the Lord is doing when he's trying to uphold his promises is not just acting for his own honor, but also acting out of love for us. So if God loves us, then he cannot compromise on his promises. God must keep us in him, must restore us to salvation, keep us in his, his grace. Otherwise, his love will have failed. And God's love will not fail. God will not allow us to be persecuted beyond what we, we are allotted here in this world. God will bring us into his salvation. God has said it, God will do it. If God was willing to compromise on the, on, on, uh, the plan of salvation, then Jesus Christ himself could have just avoided going to the cross. He could have uh, gone the way of fantasy novels, settled down with Mary Magdalene, had a whole bunch of children, and avoided crucifixion altogether. That's not what God wanted. God needed uh, Jesus Christ to go to the cross, suffer and die for our sins, so that we may be forgiven and brought into salvation. God will not compromise on this, and he has not had withheld his own son from fulfilling this promise to us, the promise of salvation to his own people. Us trying to negotiate with God, trying to hold things back from him, does not work because God will fulfill his promises. If we try to withhold ourselves, we are trying to be God over God himself. And God will not allow this to happen. This is not the order of creation. This is not true justice. This is not true grace. So God will call us to account. And in his grace, the Lord will take all of us. I mean, all of you. He will not say that I will redeem only your soul and you'll be a spiritless, a bodiless spirit in heaven. No, he says I will he will redeem the whole person. It's not that he will redeem only some of your sins and not others, saying, oh, well, I'll forgive you for uh, stealing all these candy bars, but I won't forgive you for murdering this person. No. Uh, God's justice either works or it doesn't. His grace either works or it doesn't. He either punishes you for all your sins, uh, calls you to account for all your sins, or he will, or he will uh, 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 forgive the sins uh, which you confess to him. So it's not that he partially forgives us, it's that he forgives all of us. He forgives us in totality. Uh, C.S. Lewis had a little bit of an illustration where uh, if God moves into a house, he is going to be the carpenter which basically transforms the entire house. It might be too small now for him, it might not be grand enough for God the builder of everything to live in, but he will reconstruct the house and he will make the whole thing new, much better than it was before. So God does not compromise. He will take all of you and he will recreate all of you into a new creation, make you completely whole and new in his, his salvation. If God was willing to compromise, then people would get away with uh, the worst possible evils and would not be punished for them. And if God were to compromise on his promises, then you would not receive the fullness of grace which, you, which God freely gives in Christ Jesus. But God does call people to account as he called Pharaoh to account, and he, he will uh, deliver us into his grace according, uh, 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 through faith, through faith which he gives to us. This is, 
is what God has said, and this is what will happen. Amen. Uh, we continue with the service with the Apostles' Creed, which can be found on the back cover of the hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord God Almighty, we thank and praise you that you are not a God who compromises on his, on his word. We thank you that you will call all the enemies of the faith to account so that all their sins will be tried against them so that they will be so that they will uh, enter into your judgment and find the fullness of your justice in them we also thank and praise you for the fullness of your grace that you have spoken to us that you have not just forgiven some of our sins but cleansed us entirely we pray that you uh, sustain us in this grace uh, completely not compromising on it, but give it, delivering to us the salvation which you have promised. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we pray that all people everywhere uh, hear the word of the Lord. All people are confronted with their sins so that they may be called to account for them uh, by your word. And that according to, to your grace, they may uh, repent and be saved from all the evil that they have committed. We pray, O oh Lord, that all people turn into life-saving faith, that none remain of their sins, much as uh, Pharaoh heard in his heart, but that all would turn to you in them. So that although you are a God of justice and call all to account for their sins, that you, will, you are also a God of love and peace, and that by your grace, uh, delivered through faith, that all people in faith would receive forgiveness from sin. Please, Lord, allow your word to go out throughout the world so that all people may hear your word and come to faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on, the day, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to grace beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that all our doings may be preserved from sin, our lives sanctified, and our work this day be well pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. That your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.